for all the human beings. But the cantonment area of Islam, the peaceful area, what we call, is the Harmain, Makkah and Medina. Here, no one besides the staunch believers of Islam can go. That's the cantonment area. You cannot go without being a staunch believer. Otherwise, Islam is for all human beings. Not that we are against them. But whenever you want to enter any country, you require a visa. If I have to go to America, to England, to Singapore, to Malaysia, I apply for a visa. And when I apply for visa, there are certain questionnaires, certain questions I have to answer, certain things I have to agree with. For example, when I go to Singapore, it was mentioned in the form, immigration form, death to drug traffickers, death penalty to all those who deal with drugs. I cannot say, oh, this punishment is very harsh. I don't agree with this. If you don't agree, no entry in Singapore. So if I have to enter Singapore, I have to agree that if I am caught with drug, I will be hanged. Death penalty. No option. If you don't agree with that law, don't enter the country. So if you want to apply for a visa, you have to agree with the laws of that country. Similarly, if any human being wants to enter Makkah or Medina, you have to apply for a visa. The visa for Makkah and Medina is to say with your lips verbally, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the messenger of Allah, and no one can prevent you from entering there. Uh, Brother Sundar Rao is keen on asking Dr. Zakir Naik, why do Muslims call Almighty God Allah? The question posed was, by Brother Sundar Rao, that why do Muslims call God by the name Allah? The glorious Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 110, Kulidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayyamatadu, Salal Asnal Husna. Say call upon him by Allah or by call upon him by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And the Quran gives this message in Surah Araf chapter 7, verse 180, Surah Taha chapter 20, verse number 8, and Surah Al Hashr chapter 59, verse number 24, that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the most beautiful name. And there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran, like Rahman, Rahim, Al Hakim, most merciful, most gracious, most wise. 99 attributes. And the crowning one is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic name Allah? instead of the English word God, is because the English word God, you can play mischief with that English word God. For example, if you add a S to God, it becomes God's. That means plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah in Islam. Kul hu Allah ad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add a D E S S to God, it becomes Goddess. That means a female God. There's nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique. Allah has got no gender. If you add a father to God, it becomes Godfather. He's my Godfather. He's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah Father or Allah Abba in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a unique word. If you add a mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah Mother or Allah Me in Islam. If you prefix ten before God, it becomes ten God. That means a fake God. There's nothing like ten Allah in Islam. Therefore, we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic name Allah instead of the English word God. May we have the question from the sister side, please? Assalamu alaikum. My name is Danis. I'm studying for BDS. Brother, isn't it said that during days of Prophet, Aisha radiallahu anha used to deliver speeches to the Sahabis? So isn't it important that women scholars today should also make use of media like television in Dawa, provided they are in hijab? This has asked a very good question. And she's quoted a reference that Hadrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. She used to give speeches to the Sahaba, and she has said to have taught no less than 88 different scholars. She was a scholar of scholar, and only on her authority, there are 2,210 ahadith narrated, and I do agree with that. But sister, the reason was, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she was the wife of beloved Prophet, and she was close to the Prophet, and she had memorized various ahadith, which no one in the Muslim Ummah at that time knew. So she was the scholar of the scholar. She had the maximum knowledge. So if you have an option to go to a lady who has maximum knowledge, as compared to a gent which has no knowledge at all, then going to a lady is allowed. 
So today also if a situation arises where you have a Muslim, a Muslim woman who is excellent in knowledge, then if a group of men want to go to her for knowledge, they can go. But even when Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, when she gave, she maintained the hijab. Many a time it was through a curtain, not face to face. It was through a curtain that they forgive because the wife of the Prophet had to maintain extra hijab. And the main point was because she was the human being who had one of the highest knowledge. She had certain knowledge which none of the Sahabi had. So in this situation, but natural, even today you can speak to a woman, not that you can't speak, you can get trained on a woman, but if you know that there is a man who has more knowledge than a woman, so the men should prefer to go to the men and the woman to a woman. Similarly, if a woman wants to gain knowledge, and if there's no other woman who has equal knowledge as that of a man, then she can go to a man to get knowledge. But if you tell me that a man in this world today has more knowledge than a woman, and yet you go to a woman, then that doesn't serve the purpose. It's unnecessarily breaking the hijab. But even if you have to go to a woman, you can go, but it is within the purview of Islam that the Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she used to speak very often in the curtain. So now, so if that situation arises, sister, very well, the women can give knowledge if they feel they are the best in the world and no one has equivalent knowledge to them in that field of fiqh or field of Islam. They can give maintain the Islamic hijab. Hope that answers the question. There's a non-Muslim brother by the name of Jagdish who makes a reference to one of Dr. Zakir Naik's talks yesterday. His question is, Brother Jagdish would like to know, if prophets were sent to every nation of the world, then which prophets were sent to India? Can Ram, Krishna, etc. Be considered prophets of God. Second but related question is if several revelations were sent by God before the Quran, can we consider the Vedas or the Bhagavad Gita, etc., as the word of God? The question posed was that if prophets were sent to each and every nation, as the Quran says in Surah Fatih, chapter 35, verse 24. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warning or a guide. The Quran says in Surah Raj, chapter 13, verse number 7, And to every nation have we sent a guide. Prophets were sent to each and every nation. The question posed was that which prophet was sent to India? Can we consider Ram as prophet of God, as Krishna prophet of God? And which revelation was sent to India? Can we consider Veda to be the word of God or Bhagavad Gita to be the word of God? Brother, by name, there are 25 messengers mentioned in the glorious Quran, like Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ismail, Ishaq, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. 25 by name. So whichever the Quran mentions, we can say for sure they were prophets of Almighty God. But which are not mentioned in the Quran, what we can say, maybe. There are some politicians, Muslim politicians, who say that Ram alayhi salam, you know, Ram may peace be upon him, as though he is a prophet of God. They scratch the back of the non-Muslims so that they in turn scratch their back. See what I say, that Quran doesn't mention Ram or the Prophet of God. Quran doesn't say Krishna or the Prophet of God. What I say, that maybe they were. But even if they were messengers of God, what we have to realize is that all the messengers that came, all the prophets that came before the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, they were only sent for their group of people and the message was meant for a particular time period. So even if Ram was a messenger of God, I'm not saying he is, even if he was, hypothetically, taken for granted he was, even if he was, today the Indians should not follow Ram or Krishna. Because if he was a prophet, he was only meant for that time and for those people. Today you have to follow the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was not sent only for the Muslim or the Arab, but the Quran says in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا Rahmatul Alameen, we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the creatures. The Quran says in Surah Sabah chapter 34, verse 28, Wama Arsalnaka illa kafatal nas bashira wana zero. That we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings they do not know. So even if Ram was a messenger, even if Lakshman was a messenger, even if Krishna was a messenger, he was meant for those people for that time. Even if he was, today all the people in the world, whether in India, America, Europe, Arab countries, they should follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Similarly, the name of four revelations are given in the Holy Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil and the Quran. Whether Veda is the word of God, whether Bhagavad Gita is the word of God, 
since they are not mentioned my name, I cannot say for sure they are word of God. Quran says there were revelations sent to various people, various revelations, name of all have not been mentioned. So what I say, Bhagavad Gita may be the word of God. Raman may have been the word of God. Veda may have been the word of God. I cannot say for sure. But even if they were the word of God, since all the revelations that came before the glorious Quran, they were only meant for their people as they were meant for a particular time period. Therefore the Quran says that since it was not meant for eternity, Allah didn't think it fit to preserve these revelations. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 79, it says, فَوَيْلُلْ لِلَّذِينَ يَخْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِعَيْدِهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُلُونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتُرُ بِهِ سَمْنٍ كَلِلَا فَوَيْلُلْ لَمْ مِمَّا قَدْ بَتَعِيدِهِمْ فَوَيْلُلْ لَمْ مِمَّا يَخْتُبُونَ That woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say this is from Allah to traffic with it for a miserable price woe to those for what they hand to write woe to those for what they earn that means all the revelation that came before the Quran since they were meant only for a particular group of people they were not meant for eternity Allah didn't think it fit to preserve it Therefore, they have been changed. So even if Veda were the word of God, today they are not in the authentic form. Bhagavad Gita is not maintained in the original form. Besides the Quran, all the religious scriptures have been distorted. And since Quran is not meant only for the Muslims, not meant only for the Arabs, the Quran says in Surah Ibrahim chapter 14 verse 52, that here is a message for the whole of humankind. Let them take warning there from. Let them know there is only one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 185, Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guide to the humanity, as a criteria to judge right from wrong. Quran says in Surah Al-Zumur chapter 39 verse 41, that we have revealed to thee, that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, the book to instruct mankind. It doesn't say to instruct the Arabs or the Muslims, but to instruct the whole of humankind. So Quran is a revelation which is meant till eternity and for the whole of humankind. Even if Veda was the word of God, even if Bhagavad Gita was the word of God, today it has not maintained its original form. Quran says in Surah Hijar chapter 15 verse number 9, Allah will guard it from corruption. It's an uncorrupted book. So even if Veda was the word of God, it has been changed. Even if it hasn't been changed, if some people say, it was only meant for those people and for that time. Today all the people in the world, whether living in India or America, or Europe, they should follow the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran. Question from the Gen side. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Zakir Naik, my question is you give a shocking account of the pathetic conditions of Muslims, especially of Muslims of India, I think that uh, they are lagging far behind in media generally, especially in mass media. So on and so forth, they lag far behind in journalism, etc, etc. These are all the symptoms of a disease. That means one cannot be an enemy of himself. A community cannot be the enemy of itself. When the community is lagging behind in each and every aspect, to the extent that a small offshoot of the same community, that Kadianism, they say, you say they are doing well. So will you be able to give the exact reason why Muslims are lagging behind in all these fields? Well, there's a question that why are Muslims lagging behind when we know that it's a particular condition that in media we're lacking behind, in journalism, in science and technology, why we're lacking behind? Do you know, brother, at a time we were on the top. From the 8th to the 12th centuries, it was called as the Dark Ages. As the Dark Ages. Dark for whom? Dark for the Europeans. The media today projects from the 8th to 12th century Dark Ages. Who's projecting? The media. The media. It was dark for the Europeans. They were backward. The world was not backward. The world with the limited knowledge that the Arab Muslims had. The amount of advances they made is tremendous. You know, there were Muslim scientists. Death penalty to all those who deal with drugs. I cannot say, oh, this punishment is very harsh. I don't agree with this. If you don't agree, no entry in Singapore. So if I have to enter Singapore, I have to agree that if I am caught with drug, I will be hanged. Death penalty. No option. If you don't agree with that law, don't enter the country. So if you want to apply... Uh, Brother Sundar Rao is keen on asking Dr. Zakir Naik, why do Muslims call Almighty God Allah? The question posed was, Rabbi Sundar Rao, 
that why do Muslims call God by the name Allah? For a visa, you have to agree with the laws of that country. Similarly, if any human being wants to enter Makkah or Medina, you have to apply for a visa. The visa for Makkah and Medina is to say with your lips verbally, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the Messenger of Allah, and no one can prevent you from entering there. For all the human beings. But the cantonment area of Islam, the peaceful area, what we call, is the Harmain, Makkah and Medina. Here, no one besides the staunch believers of Islam can go. That's the cantonment area. You cannot go without being a staunch believer. Otherwise, Islam is for all human beings. Not that we are against them. But whenever you want to enter any country, you require a visa. If I have to go to America, to England, to Singapore, to Malaysia, I apply for a visa. And when I apply for a visa, there are certain questionnaires, certain questions I have to answer. Certain things I have to agree with. For example, when I go to Singapore, it was mentioned in the form, immigration form. Death to drug traffickers. 